Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Betting Life Podcast brought to you by Fantasy Life. I'm Matthew Friedman, Matt F. The Oracle. It is Friday. It is almost Christmas and more importantly, Festivus is uh, almost here. So, you know, that that's something that we should all look forward to. Jeff, I'm assuming that you are a, a Seinfeld fan, although I, I shouldn't make that assumption about anyone, but you seem like a cool guy. So I'm just going to assume that you you like Seinfeld. Yeah, no, um, definitely Festivus for the rest of us. I mean, yeah, I, you know, Watched uh, watched pretty much every episode at least four times. I would say, you know, at, at a certain part of my life, it's been a while now. But I, you know, there, it's everything is imprinted in my brain. You know, the the wrestling, the feats of strength. You know, the the pull, whatever else George's dad yeah. did. I can't even remember. Yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely, man. I mean, big Seinfeld guy. And um, yeah, one day I'll have to take another run through that show. But like I said, I've I've watched it enough where I. Can basically just rewatch it in my head at this point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The the airing of grievances. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic show. So I was like you. I was thinking about maybe doing a little bit of a rewatch. Uh, throughout the season. I, you know what? Normally we get into the show. By the way, this is Jeff Ulrich, aka the Fantasy Grind. Jeff. Um, normally we get into the show, but we're at the end of the season. It is nice to uh, to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about stuff that's like you know stuff that like sports fans are like or like people in our like bracket are probably interested in, but things that aren't like directly sports related and Seinfeld, I imagine would be one of those things. Um, but so I have been like a hardcore Seinfeld fan, haven't watched it in years. And, uh, every year throughout the football season, I start to do rewatches of different shows, like having this running in the background as I'm doing work. And like, so the first you know, like maybe eight weeks of the season, I don't do this because I'm really focused. But like after a while, I start to need something like in the back of my brain just to make, you know, like what I'm doing, like a little less tedious or whatever it is. Do you have like that same sort of thing where, you know, like you're, you have shows going in the background, like shows you're familiar with or movies you're familiar with, whatever it is. Yeah. So I like if I really because I do get to that point sometimes too. Where I'll put something on in the background. I usually opt for like some like really stupid superhero show, like like a Marvel movie or something like that. Because okay. but I, I do rewatch shows though. But I, I generally will like sit and watch them because like if I'm rewatching a show, it's usually like a like I would like rewatch like Mad Men or something like that. I I will say this. The last show I rewatched was when my kids were really young and they were like, you know, like, like hold them and like feed them a bottle. And we, I had friends on in the background for like six months in a row. Like it was just like rewatching friends. So it wasn't, and it wasn't, I don't even know. Like I wasn't even like that big a friends guy. Like I was way more of a Seinfeld guy, but I was just like, I haven't seen the show in a while. So I just put it on and it was like in the background of my house for like six months. So that's probably the last time I, I put a show on like that, but I mean, I usually opt for like the dumb superhero movies. Like I'll just rewatch like Iron Man three or something horrible like that. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say those are, those are terrible movies by any means. Um, it's like star Wars for me as yeah. like, if I'm going to put on a movie instead of a show, the star Wars movies, Lord of the Rings movies. Like I have those so ingrained in my head at this point that I can, I can have it running in the background without it distracting yeah. me. But like, exactly. it is also something that kind of serves as like background noise. Like, in, like, you know, like if you went to go work at a coffee shop or something, there would be like just sort of this white background noise. That's a little bit what those movies are like for me yeah. at this point. Uh, exactly. Lord, Lord of the Rings, definitely in that category. Uh, like for a show that uh, rewatches very well for me as background noise, uh, Game of Thrones. That one really kind of hits the spot for me because it's if it yeah. feels uh, Lord of the Rings ish in terms of like their swords in the background and stuff like that, yeah. you know, dragons, etc. And there's there's like conversation, but then there's also action sequence. So like you can like yes. tune out some of the conversations. And the only thing I, it's actually funny, like I, I probably do for a Game of Thrones rewatch, but the last season turned me off that show so much. That I've almost like vetoed it. Like I almost refuse to rewatch it. I know the like the first four of whatever five seasons were great. I really enjoyed yeah. them. I thought they were all done. But like the last two seasons, I'm just so put off by how they finished it that like I almost don't want to go back. But I they they were so good up to like that point that it's still worth a rewatch. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, like I kind of found that on rewatch, I didn't hate the ending 
I mean, like, right. well, I mean, the ending wasn't great, but I didn't hate like the final two seasons as much as I anticipated. Or like there were enough banger episodes peppered throughout yeah. to where it was like, okay, this this still works for me. Like, I don't yeah. I don't know if you ever have this. And by the way, I swear to everyone listening, we will get to props uh at, at some point in this episode very shortly. But Jeff, I don't know if you have the thing where like there's maybe like a song that you absolutely hated when you were young and it would come on the radio and you're like, what is this? You change the station and then you hear it like 20 years later and there's like this little bit of nostalgia that kicks in and it's like, yeah. you know, that, that song is not absolutely terrible. Yeah, it's for me, it would probably be like some of those like old songs that my parents probably would play or something. Like I don't have okay. a specific one in mind, but it's like, oh my God, this is horrible. Like dad, t- turn it off or something. And then you listen to it like 10 years later and you're like, actually, this is like pretty good song or something. Or like, you might even like go out and like listen to the group or something. So yeah, for me, it was like probably those older songs that you like gain an appreciation for as you like become more mature, so to speak, or, you know, semi more yeah. mature. It, it feels like uh, you are talking about Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young without saying the band. No, no, but I'm just, <laughs> like, that feels like, example. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it feels like the quintessential like dad music to where it's like, what yeah. is this? And then you hear it later. And it's like, you know, what? this is actually pretty good. All right. Yeah. So anyway, we're going to get into it. It is the prop pod. Jeff and I are going to break down 10 of our favorite player props on the board for week 16. A reminder, you can find our props and lots of other bets in our 100% free fantasy life bet tracker. You can check out the discord where we uh, post some bets in there. Player projections. Uh, my player projections are in the fantasy life projections tool, which of course is 100% free along with everything else on the site, uh, along with our official site projections in the fantasy tool. And then we have the prop tool, which allows you to compare our projections with the props across the market. And of course, remember that lines in our projections do change. Okay. Jeff kicking it off here. The first prop that you like for this week, Jerome Ford over 14 and a half receiving yards. I feel like you were on Jerome Ford last week or maybe the week before. And I think that one hit yeah. for you like very quickly. Yeah. I, I, it was either two or three weeks ago, but yeah, it hit in like the first series. It was, it was one of Flacco's actually it was, it was two weeks ago. Cause yeah, it was Flacco's second game. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I wasn't super convinced that I needed to go back to it, but like his, his prop is still at 14 and a half. I think that week I played it at 12 and a half, but I think it closed at 14 and a half, maybe even closed higher than that. Maybe it closed at 16 and a half, but I just found it interesting. It was back at 14 and a half. Um, I, you know, and again, like using our free projections, using our utilization report, like these, this is how I'm coming to a lot of these props. And like, I mean, all the info is there for you guys as well, but you look at our utilization report, He's playing about 50% of the snaps. He's been over 50% of the snaps in the last and two of the last three games. But his route rate is is around 40 to 50% every week. He's getting that target share in the 10% range. Uh, he's a pretty good receiver. And you know, the other guys that come on just they just don't do much in the receiving game. Cream Hunt is just done. I mean, they just need to cut him at this. Like he's he's done or than done. But Ford is really the receiving back. Um, you know, and, and they're playing the Texans who Again, a pretty good rush defense, but they don't defend against the the pass very well into the backfield. Six most most receiving yards. I see this as another spot where you know Ford is probably going to get his three to four targets, and against like a, a defense like this, I think that he probably gets there again. So um, I don't think he got there last week. I think he had a bit of a. I think he had like four catches for eleven yards or something. But you know, again, like the the weeks before with Flacco were really good. So um, thirty one yards, thirty three yards. And I just like Joe Flacco under center for Jerome Ford. Uh, I think he probably bounces back back and goes over on this one. Like I said, this one was probably again, of the props we're doing. I, I ranked it fifth, but I still think it's strong enough, you know, to, to bet. Um, I think that you can just keep targeting Jerome Ford. I think it's probably a yard or two too short. We got this projected in the 18 yard range, which gives us a, a couple yard edge. Um, as long as it's at 14 and a half, I would play it. Yeah, so this one has moved up a little bit. It's there's still a 15 and a half across the market. Okay. I have it projected at uh let me see. I've projected higher even than the 18.6 that that Dwayne has. So Dwayne McFarland, uh very sharp projector, uh manages the official site projections. He has it at around 18 and a half. I have it at 19.8. So I I still like it at 15 and a half. I think I would yeah. probably take it there. So yeah, uh, I like that one. I like that one. All right. 
my first one on the board here, Raheem Mostert, anytime touchdown, minus 115 at FanDuel. Let me make sure that uh, number is still representative. Yeah, that's still available. So I like it there. I will say I don't have much of a difference between my official projection and the numbers in the market right now, but I do think there's value at minus 115. I'd probably be willing to take it to minus 120, minus 125. I mean, the Dolphins-Cowboys game easily has the week's highest total on the board, you know, anywhere from like 49 and a half to 50 and a half, depending where you're looking. So a lot of points I think we will see in this game. The Dolphins are home favorites, so they could have a little bit more of a run leaning game script than they would usually have. And I think that's especially the case against the Cowboys who are number 32 in defensive rush success rate. So dead last. And the thing with the Cowboys, it's not so much that they are allowing like massive chunk plays on the ground, uh, but they're like getting like sliced to death with a thousand paper cuts. Like they just consistently allow teams to get what they need on the ground. Uh, and I think that means we could have a lot of Mostert in the spot, but Mostert like is one of those runners who, if he's able to pick up like 10 yards, he might be able to take it 50 yards because like he is one of the, the most explosive runners in the league. And, you know, we've seen that consistently throughout his career and then he's been able to stay healthy and he's getting the goal line work. He leads the league with 20 touchdowns this year. He scored in 11 of 14 games, uh, 78.6% of his games in the five games since the week 10 by he scored in all of them, except for one, he scored seven touchdowns in those five games. Like he is, he's on uh, you know, in a fantasy perspective, he's one of my favorites this week. And given what we saw last week with James Cook against the Cowboys, who just absolutely destroyed them, 179 yards and a touchdown on the ground, 42 yards receiving and a receiving touchdown. Like given all of that, I think it's hard to imagine Mostert not having success this week against the Cowboys. So Raheem Mostert, anytime touchdown minus 115. Jeff, any thoughts on Mostert this week? Uh, I mean, I, I, I really like the spot for most or two. I mean, obviously you, you'd wish you could get like a, a minus or like a plus 100 or something. I, I just saw his minus 110 at bet three, six, five, two, if people have access to that, that may come down throughout the week. I, I wouldn't be shocked if this just came down across the market. Like you said, I mean, the, the Cowboys rush defense, they've been battered um, in a couple spots. They're, they're not looking so great over the last few games. They're not on the road again here. I think it's going to be a heavy Moster game too. Um, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, just the, it's such a big total. He's probably going to find the end zone. So certainly a guy for a touchdown play that I had on my radar as well. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Cowboys beat up, uh, missing their main run stuffing defensive tackle and Jonathan Hankins, uh, the second, you know, back-to-back -back road game that's East coast for them. So, you know, playing in Buffalo, traveling back to Dallas and then traveling back to Miami. It's just, it's not a great setup for the Cowboys. So yeah, Raheem Mostert, anytime touchdown there, Jeff, you and I have two bets here that, uh, align very nicely. And it just kind of happened to work out that way. You have Josh Reynolds over one and a half uh, receptions. Actually, I don't know if these bets really do align. I mean, well, I don't know. I think I think they are kind of correlated, but yeah. uh, you know. Yeah. Anyway, so Josh Reynolds over one and a half receptions. That's a bet you have here. Yeah. So again, I I, I think like you, I wanted to look at this Lions passing game. I think it's a pretty good spot. Minnesota is a, a typical like funnel to the pass defense. Very good rush defense. Um, but they've allowed the fourth most receptions to opposing wide receivers. Um, I took a look at, you know, maybe Jared going over on Jared Goff's pass attempts is something else I might play, but Josh Reynolds over 1.5 receptions. We have this projected at 1.9. Um, he's gone over this in 10 games this year. And like I said, Minnesota's allowed the fourth most receptions to opposing wide receivers. And the thing I like about Reynolds here is that, you know, they, they have a pretty solid top corner in Byron Murphy jr. But we know he's going to be busy with the Monroe St. Brown. So that kind of leaves Reynolds to just float around the field. And at this point, and I think, I think we're on the same page here at this point, it feels like Jamison Williams is, you know, I mean, I, I guess he had like a 22% target share last week, but um, you know, I'm, I'm not too worried about Jamison Williams, you know, like eating up too many targets or, or doing too much here. He's out there, but he's not going to be the primary target. I think Josh Reynolds is kind of the go-to guy 
uh, in terms of like secondary targets after Amon Ross St. Brown and Laporta, obviously. But, um, you know, um, Reynolds has been really consistent when he's been healthy. Um, the last two games have gone over 40 yards. I, I thought about going over his yards too. It's 19.5. We have him projected at 20. You could certainly combine the receptions and yards for a same game parlay. I love doing that in, in places like this where it just looks like we're kind of, you know, it's just too low on both. And I will probably bet him that way. Uh, but for, for this bet, I'm just going straight over the receptions. Like I said, um, I think that this is the, the style of game on the road. Minnesota probably forces Detroit to pass the ball again, Detroit, not a great defense either. And Reynolds probably gets his, his th- four targets, which gets us to two receptions. So um, yeah, I just like the spot in general for the, the Lions passing game. And right now it feels like the best value is uh, to me on Reynolds. All right. So my bet is similar. Uh, Khalif Raymond over 10 and a half yards receiving. And if you just look at what the, uh, what the lions have been doing recently with their wide receiver rotation, it's obviously a Ross St. Brown on the field for, you know, almost every route. And then yeah. after that, there's this kind of cycling three man committee with Josh Reynolds, Jamison Williams and Khalif Raymond. And Raymond is uh, like the least of those three, just in terms of his usage, but he does get enough usage. But and I think it does touch to the point, your bet and my bet that after Amon Ross St. Brown, and then obviously Laporta, they do spread the ball a little bit between these other guys. And because of the matchup, I do think that there's actually sufficient value in both Reynolds and and Raymond, given what we might see out of that entire passing game in general. So Khalif Raymond over 10 and a half receiving yards. I have that projected at 15.5. I would probably bet it up to 12 and a half. And, you know, (laughs) I think it's a disgusting bet. I think yours also kind of qualifies as like that disgusting bet where like we're taking the over on uh, like a number three uh, pass catcher, maybe even yeah. a number four pass catcher in an offense. But I think there's enough offensive goodness in this game for the over to hit here. Um, Raymond, he's he's gone over, I mean, similar to Reynolds going over one and a half receptions in the super majority of games. Raymond has gone over uh, this number of 10 and a half receiving yards in 11 of 14 games. He has an average of 10.2 yards per target this year, 9.9 since last year. So, I mean, I'm basically hoping that Raymond has two, two plus targets in this game, but you know, like at least two targets in this game in 10 games with that kind of volume, he's gone over nine times. And even with just one target, given that he's at 10.2 yards per target, even with just one target, he has a chance of going over 10 and a half yards receiving. Uh, so, you know, it's a buy low spot in the market. 10 and a half is the lowest total uh, we've seen for the yardage prop for Raymond over the past two years. Grant, just a part-time player, but he still had a, uh, let me see, a 31% route rate last week. Since the week nine buy, he has a 22% target rate. And of course, that's from our utilization report at Fantasy Life. You know, I think just 10 and a half is so low for a guy who is explosive, is still seeing some targets and is still running enough routes out there. So asking for two targets, that that doesn't feel like it's too much. So Khalif Raymond over 10 and a half receiving yards. Jeff, Chuba Hubbard, or anything you want to say about Raymond really quick. I was going to say that the thing I like about Detroit and targeting those, these receivers is just they pass in all situations. So like, even if they get up in this game, you know, they're in a dome, they're, they're going to pass. I mean, Jared Goff averages like 34 attempts. So yeah, I, I mean, I think the game script will be in our favor. Like, I think it'll be a close game. I think Minnesota could even get up in this spot. And then we really get like 40 attempts, but like, even if we don't, I mean, I think we're going up against the weak secondary. So it's all about the team you're targeting. Obviously we're not going to be targeting like guys like this on like Carolina or something, but, or I, I mean, I did early in the year, but I'm not anymore, but um, you know, like Detroit is a different story. So whenever you're doing things like this, you always want to look at the situation. I, I think we're targeting the right kind of situation anyways. All right. All right. So uh, Chuba Hubbard. That is your next bet yeah. here over 68 and a half rushing yards. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I initially put this as over 16 and a half carries, but I forgot I bet it in the tracker as yards, but I like both. Um, this is one of those spots where I'm playing. I'm, I'm going against our projections. Our projections have Hubbard as like, you basically right around this level. I think they have him actually at 16 carries, but in my opinion, um, they, the, 
the projections just haven't caught up with the rate that Chuba Hubbard has been carrying and seeing the field of late because it's been basically going from like 20 miles an hour to like 100 miles an hour in the span of three games. And I just don't think the projections have caught up. I think we're very much in a Kieran Williams kind of situation where he just keeps getting volume and volume and yards and yards. And like the props, the, the projections and the totals just can't keep up. And I, I'm fine just going over on, on Hubbard, Hubbard again. I don't think we're we're buying the top or anything here. He's averaged 23 carries his last three games. He's playing Green Bay, a bottom 10 rush defense uh, by most metrics. And just to give you an example here, between weeks 10 and 12, he averaged 41.6 yards per game. Uh, his low was 23 yards. His high was 57 yards between weeks 13 and 15, 92 yards per game. His low was 87 yards and his high was 104 yards. So um, again, completely different player at this point. Miles Sanders had six carries for two yards last week. Miles Sanders isn't coming back on the field. Um, a Green Bay's allowed 5.3 yards per carry against the last three games. I actually think the other thing that goes with the story, I actually think the Panthers have a chance to win this game. And because I think that it just lends more to this bet because they're not doing it on Bryce Young's arm. They're going to do it on the back of Chuba Hubbard chewing up this defense, which I think he's going to do. Um, and I'll say one more thing about this. If you're on bet three, six, five, you can combine carries and yards into a same game parlay for a player. I'm going to do that with Chuba Hubbard over 16 and a half carries and over whatever his yardage total is there at now. I think it's at 69 and a half. Um, I think Hubbard's going to go for like hundred yards here. I, 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 again, going against the projections, but I just think the projections in these spots, they have a hard time keeping up with the player. You know, I actually do like this call, even though it is going against my projection. I, I could see how the projection ends up being wrong here. And to kind of add some fire to your case, uh, Devondre Campbell linebacker for the Packers. He's dealing with a neck injury. He hasn't practiced Wednesday or Thursday. I think he's probably going to be out Uh strong safety. Darnell Savage, who you know, like in the secondary is, you know, more of like the run game enforcer. I think he's probably going to be out uh, dealing with a shoulder injury. He hasn't practiced this week. You mentioned the, uh, the Packers being bad uh, against the run in general. And, you know, I, for a lot of the season, I've seen value, like kind of like quote unquote value on the Panthers. And I haven't bet it just because like, I don't buy it, but yeah. this, I I'm probably not going to, to buy it this, this week either, but I can see it. I can see it more realistically this yeah. week than I have yeah. in previous weeks. So yeah, I could see a situation where, uh, you know, the, the Packers kind of floundering a little bit dealing with injuries. Um, the Panthers are able to get ahead or keep it like close enough to where it's just Chuba Hubbard for the entire game. So uh, I like it. I, I do like it. I can, I can see the path for it. So I might want to go back in and adjust the, uh, the projections I have a little bit. This you're, you're talking me into it here. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, Russell Wilson. I'm, I mean, this is a disgusting game that we have Christmas Eve, yeah. Sunday night football, the Patriots at the Broncos, uh, and, and, uh, I'm betting over Russell Wilson, 27.5 pass attempts, got this at even money at DraftKings. I have the projection at 30.2 and I would bet it up to 28 and a half. The forecast here, it's calling for snow, but like not, it doesn't look like it's going to be a ton of snow and the wind is projected for less than 10 miles per hour at kickoff. So I don't think like the weather is actually going to be severe enough to force the Broncos to abandon the passing game. And even though head coach Sean Payton has this, like I would say very obvious desire to minimize the impact of Russell Wilson within the offense, Wilson has still gone over 27 and a half pass attempts in 10 of 14 games. His average for the year is 29.3. And the matchup is tough against the Patriots. Like they are the definition of a pass funnel. The Patriots are number one in defensive rush EPA, defensive rush success rate. Running against them is almost pointless. And I think that Sean Payton is probably sharp enough as a coach to know that. Um, but the, the Pats, can, they can very much be passed on. They're number 21 in defensive drawback EPA, number 23 in drawback success rate. So I think that means even though the team probably doesn't want Russell Wilson dropping back all that often, he probably drops back enough to hit the over on this. And the Patriots have allowed quarterbacks to average 34.7 pass attempts 
this year. In only two games has an opponent not had at least 27 and a half pass attempts against them. So you put all that together, and then there's the fact that this is a, a buy low spot in the market. Uh, Wilson's pass attempts prop has never been lower than the 27 and a half that we see this year. So uh, let me rephrase that. It's never been lower this year than the 27 and a half we see in the market. But also when I was looking at the market, like for the numbers last year, uh, it wasn't this low. So I think you put all that together. It's just a really good buy low spot for Russell Wilson. And I get that. I mean, this offense doesn't want Wilson throwing the ball and maybe the weather stuff ends up being worse than I'm anticipating. But right now, I just kind of don't see enough that pushes me in the direction of thinking we don't see Russell Wilson go over 27 and a half. Yeah, I, I mean, the Broncos haven't been as good running the ball lately either. So I would concern me like just from a if I was a Broncos fan, I mean, I do feel like at some point they're going to have to pass the ball here. I guess the and the other thing is. I mean, the, you know, Bailey Zappi could throw like two interceptions and then, and then, you know, I'm just thinking of ways this won't hit, but I mean, it's really low. So yeah, I, I mean, typically I know I, I saw this one when I came out too, and I was like, man, that's low, but uh, it does make sense to go over. I'm not going to bet an under, especially against the Patriots, like you said. So yeah, I, th I think just watch the weather is the only thing if it gets worse, but I, I don't think it's going to get that bad. Didn't look that bad to me either. So um, yeah. Wilson's been throwing it a little bit more. I mean, uh, I know I've had his, his over on the, the yardage yards a couple weeks in a row. I don't think this is a spot where you can necessarily just drop him back 20 times and be done with it. Um, Patriots have played good. I, I think that game will be competitive too, which will probably help you as well. So. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I'll say is that the market has, the betting market has moved in the direction of the Broncos. And if that is the real thing and they end up getting out to a lead, then even though they would be running into the teeth of you know the best run defense in the league, they still might do that just because they have the lead. And so yeah. I I feel like that is the one way in which the under hits here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, other than that, I think uh, there's a very good chance that we see this go over. All right, Tyler Algier over eight and a half carries. I I love this one because yeah. uh, it's like let's keep let's play the hits because this one yeah. was awesome for you last week. Um, you talked about it on this show last week. You talked about it on the live stream. Uh, the, it was never in doubt. And like Algier was fed so much that it looked like Arthur Smith might lose his job after the game because of the way in which he was just uh, ignoring Bijan yeah. Robinson and Drake London and Kyle Pitts so that he could give the ball to a second year, fifth rounder. Uh, you're back on it. Tyler Algier over eight and a half carries. Yeah. Um, you know, again, like you said, let's just keep playing it until, you know, either it adjusts or it doesn't hit. And, uh, I have no reason to think that it's not going to hit again. He's gone for over this in, let's just do a quick count here since week five, one, two, three, four, nine, nine times. So he's had two games since week five where he hasn't gone over. And in those games, he had eight carries. So he got right to the verge of getting there. So um, you know, again, 14 carries last week. I don't know if we'll get there again. It's not as good a matchup against Carolina. You know, it's not soggy in the rain. Obviously we're back in the dome. Um, but Indianapolis isn't a great rush defense. They haven't been since they lost Shaq Leonard. Uh, I know they're good against Pittsburgh last week, but you know, that's Pittsburgh. And, um, I, I think that they'll, they'll have a little bit more trouble with Atlanta on the road here. So again, um, I, we have this projected at 9.5 there's still a pretty solid edge here that, you know, like, I don't think we need to be afraid of this at all. Um, will Bijan Robinson get a little bit more work in this game? Yeah, I, I think he probably will. Will Algier still get, you know, plenty of, of opportunities and early down carries. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also the, the potential here, you know, Atlanta comes out, um, you know, Garner Minshew could throw a pick Gar you know, the, the Colts on the road could, could just fumble it. And then, you know, Len is just running it like 40 times in this game and Algier and everyone goes over. So again, this is just too low. We have this projected with a one, one carry edge, which is huge when we're talking about carry totals under 10. Um, yeah, I, I would play this up to like minus 130 at 8.5. And um, I, it's something I would jump on as well. I almost, I, I think, again, another spot where you could probably combine carries and yards if you have bet 365, because his yardage prop is still only at 33 and a half it's still low. Like we still have that projected for an edge. So just giving no Tyler Algier, no respect. I guess everyone's expecting Bijan to just get another 20 carries. He might, but 
Um, I think Algier could still go over in the spot. I, I don't think that, you know, we got a close game projected. I don't think the Colts are infallible enough that we need to give them that much respect to say, oh, like, you know, Atlanta's going to stop running the ball in the second half or something. So, yeah, I like this one again. Just keep playing it at these levels, I think. Yeah, I'm with you on the eight and a half. And I think I might even like the rushing yardage over a little bit more. 33 and a half. That just feels so low given what yep. we've seen out of Algier. I have this projected at 41. So, yeah, uh, I like that one a lot. Uh, this offseason, I did a uh, a team preview series where I looked at uh, like kind of projected out the 53 man roster for all the teams, looked at the the futures markets and highlighted a bet that I liked sort of like my, my favorite bet in the futures market at that time for that team. And, you know, for some of them, it was, you know, kind of like an obvious, like, oh, uh, this team to win their division or something like that. But for some of them, it was right. a player prop. And the bet that I liked the most for the Falcons this off season was Tyler Algier over 480 and a half rushing yards this right. year. Like even that just on its face seemed so ridiculously low, given yep. what we saw out of Algier last year. Um, the fact that the, uh, the team is so run heavy that it was probable Alger would still have a role. And then it's possible that Bijan Robinson, like, you know, he could be awesome, but maybe he's not. And so maybe there's, you know, a little bit of timeshare. And then maybe he suffers an injury because he plays a really fragile position where everyone can get injured. Uh, I mean, and I think we've just seen like the Tyler Alger thing continue incessantly throughout this season. So, I mean, unless Tyler Alger loses a hundred yards, over the rest of the season, like, you know, the over four eighty and a half is just absolutely going to crush, but man, like the Tyler, yeah. yeah, the, the Tyler Algier thing, uh, it, it just feels like this has been like, uh, a, a tank that you could see approaching f like from miles away and yeah. there's nothing that can stop it. All right. Uh, so Tyler Algier love that over eight and a half carries. Uh, another one that uh, I think I highlighted last week, Jalen Hurts over 0.5 interceptions. Uh, last week, this number I think was like plus 135. Now it is plus 160. I have this projected at plus 120 and would bet it up to plus 140. Hurts, I mean, it feels like needless to say, but he has not been the best version of himself this year. And then now he has a short week of rest following a post Monday night football cross country trip back home from Seattle to Philadelphia. So like that on its own, Phil is pretty subpar in 14 games this year. He has 12 interceptions on a 2.6% interception rate, which is the highest mark he's had throughout his nearly three seasons as a starter. The giants have an aggressive defense that has 13 interceptions, all of which have come since week five. So, I mean, they got nothing in the first month of the season since then they've you know been something of a, a ball hawking defense. The Eagles should win as big home favorites. Hertz has a better than 50% uh, chance to avoid an interception in this game, but the plus 160 odds are just too tempting to pass up given that he's thrown an interception in eight of 14 games. So plus 160 uh, to throw an interception. Again, like the risk, it's similar to the risk with uh, Russell Wilson. If the Eagles get up to such an extent, we might not see many Jalen Hurts pass attempts in this game. Uh, and so it just might be fewer possibilities, opportunities for interceptions. And then, of course, if they are up big, he might also be less aggressive with the ball on the pass attempts he does have. So I can see why this is as high as plus 160, but I just think that it's probably still a little bit too uh, too optimistic given what we've seen out of him and then what we've seen out of the Giants defense. So Jalen Hurts over 0.5 interceptions plus 160. Yeah, and the Giants defense has played pretty good of late. Like, I mean, they're not they're not fantastic, but their secondary has been good. And like you said, they're aggressive. They have good young talent. Um, I, I the Eagles, I, I'm starting to really think that the offensive coordinator for that team is is becoming a real issue. Like calling some of the play calls late in that game against Seattle. I mean, they they literally had the game won. And like calling like deep shots on like like just ridiculous stuff. Um and if it's going to, if he's going to keep doing that stuff, then, you know, like to, to Quez Watkins, I mean, sure. Let's play the over, over INTs. I mean, Jalen hurts does not look as comfortable late in the games as he did last year. So yeah. Um, I just think the price too, plus plus one sixty, 
I mean, for almost for any quarterback at that price, like we're talking, it's almost a must bet, but like Hertz has not been as good. The Eagles offense, certainly not as in sync. Yeah. Um, like it again, probably tail you again, like I did last Monday. <laughs> All right. Uh, the final one here for you on the board. And uh, I will I will confess that I did not go through the outline in advance to see what the uh, what the bets were. I like to I like to see them fresh, you know, like with yeah. the fresh eyes, get their the real response. I gotta say, this one is my favorite, and I I can see why it's the one that you put as your favorite in here. Right. Sam Howell under thirty six and a half pass attempts. Yeah, I actually, you know, it, it was it was a weird week for props for me because I didn't usually a couple things really stick out right away. And um, obviously, if you watch the show, I probably tend to play more overs than unders. But a couple unders stuck out to me this week first. And this one was like prime center. Um, again, this Sam Howell, 36.5 pass attempts. He's playing the Jets. Um, so right off the bat, like, what do you do against the Jets? Well, you try not to pass the ball that much, right? And then you've got Sam Howell coming off a game where he got pulled. He's been brutal like three, four games in a row now. He's been throwing INTs. What do you do with a young quarterback that's struggling? You try to just take everything off his plate like the Panthers have done with Bryce Young and run the ball. Um, that's typically what you do against the Jets. Teams against the Jets this year have averaged 30.6 rush at, uh, pass attempts. And again, like we're going up against the Jets offense here also that's going to be run by Trevor Simeon. So there's a chance the commanders just get out to a lead and they're like, okay, hand the ball off Sam to, to Rodriguez, whoever, Brian Robinson. And that's the game. I just can't see the commanders coming in with a game plan that has Sam Howell chucking the ball all over the yard. That just seems so foreign in this spot. And then there's obviously absolutely no guarantee that Sam Howell even plays this entire game, because if they do start chucking it and he's bad again, Brissett's coming in. Brissett was really good last week. He almost won them the game. I can't see them not taking Howell out again. So I think there's so many things working in our favor here. This one has moved down to 35 and a half, but we have a projected at 33. So this is a huge edge for attempts and, and volume prop. That's about as big as I've seen this year or one of the biggest. I shouldn't say as big, but it's, it's up there, especially for a quarterback. So yeah, I definitely play it at 35 and a half. Um, a good prop to look at on underdog. If you're looking for like to finish off, um, three-way tickets as well, you might want to look at like the completions or something like that too. But the, th I think the, the attempts was the, the obvious one to me. Um, I just like the under on Sam Howell this week. I always love it when there's a chance a guy may not finish the game. And we certainly have that here. So yeah, uh, unders on, on Sam Howell under 36.5 attempts. That's what I got. Uh, like I said, I played to 35 and a half. Yeah, love this. I have this projected at 33.9. And so I I still think it's bettable at 35 and a half. Uh you mentioned the pass completions. Uh 21 and a half is the number that I'm seeing in the market. And I'm actually not all that far off from that. So I don't know if I would be betting that, but the the pass attempts really stands out to me because as you mentioned, tough defense and the big, the big cherry on top of all of this is that he could get pulled. So I yeah. uh, just absolutely love this bet here. Uh, I just home run. Absolutely. I mean, like I, I want to think like, I like this bet so much that it makes me want to think of like different same game parlays for this game in which I can include this. Uh, absolutely love this one. All right. Uh, the final prop for me here, uh, going back to old faithful Christian McCaffrey, anytime touchdown, this is minus two ten at FanDuel, And let me kind of put some perspective on it like so normally i don't think there's much value in the the touchdown market but with christian mccaffrey it is different but like there is such a discrepancy in in the prop market in general on a number of props as i'd say specifically in the touchdown market where books just kind of value different things um so this number is as low as 210 at fanduel it is as high as minus 400 at caesars so you know, say whatever you want about like some of these different books in terms of like, oh, this one is sharper. This one's more of a rec book, whatever. But, you know, like Caesars, they, you know, take higher limits, whatever. Like that minus 400 at Caesars, like I think that is more of a representative number than some of the lower numbers that we see at other books. And so if I'm able to get minus 210 
uh, when the real number should probably be closer to 400, uh, I'm going to do it. Now, I have this projected at minus 282. So, uh, you know, I think it's bettable up to minus 250, but really do like it here at the minus 210. And this is the game of the year. Christian McCaffrey, 49ers hosting the Ravens in prime time on December 25. Like, there's no way uh, I'm not having a bet on this game in some fashion. Uh, and I would say that it is uh, literally un American or at least unpoetic not to have action on a dude named Christian on this of all holy days. So, uh, you know, even just for the memes, I am betting on Christian McCaffrey on Christmas. And he has a league high 20 touchdowns, uh, a league high 301 touches, league high 1,800 yards from scrimmage. He scored in all but two of 14 games this year. He's the front runner for offensive player of the year. Like he just offers value in the touchdown down market every week even though this number is heavily juiced it is not juiced enough so christian mccaffrey anytime touchdown minus 210 at FanDuel. uh i will be i wouldn't say even sweating this i will just be watching this game uh enjoying the nightcap on christmas knowing that it is near inevitability that somehow christian mccaffrey finds the end zone yeah, I mean, if if they're just going to keep putting these numbers up, like, I mean, it, it's so simple, but like, and and I think people just get afraid of it. It's like, oh, touchdowns, like they are volatile, but like Christian, it's just different with Christian McCaffrey. I mean, he's, he's the primary back in like the league leading offense that just scores at will. So he's always in the red zone and he's always getting those touch. It's like, I don't even know how to, to compare it. Like, but it's like betting a t Christian McCaffrey touchdown prop is like betting like a Justin Jefferson over at like 60 yards or something, you know, like it's just, it's always going to happen. Like that's what it is though. I mean, real, realistically, like every 49ers game. So yeah. Um, if they're just going to keep putting this, I mean, cause I agree with the price, like, I mean, minus two Oh eight is just, or minus two ten is not, it's just not low enough. Like it, it, it needs to be in the minus 300. I'm surprised that this keeps getting put out, but like you said, different books have different motivations. I'm sure people are using this and same game parlays and stuff and the books don't mind that. So they probably keep it light. Uh, I have no idea, but anyways, it's there for us to take advantage of and you should. And I think the, just the last thing, I think the 49ers are going to, they're going to clean some clocks on Christmas day. That, that would be my prediction. I know that the Ravens are pretty solid, but I, I think the 49ers will, will come out of this one um, winning the game and, and potentially proving a point. And that'll include a Christian McCaffrey touchdown as it always does. So. All right. Well, my uh, Brock Purdy MVP ticket is very much hoping that you are oh, yeah. correct. I think with we're going to catch the 49ers. That too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that is fun. a very fun episode. Jeff, uh, happy holidays. Do you, do you have any like traditions, like Christmas traditions, things with the family, stuff like that? Uh, you know, for, for us, it's just like traveling around. We have, we have like close family, close to our house. So my Christmas day, especially since I've had kids is just like driving around to different houses, like all day. And my kids just like getting present orgies at every house. So, you know, I'm just like the yeah. chauffeur on Christmas day. Like that's what it's turned into. But yeah, as far as like other traditions, no, I mean, for me, it's just, you know, watching a little sports, taking like a little bit of downtime and nothing crazy. Yeah. I usually play my kids video games at night because I get them a video game so I can play it. And then, you know, that's about it. <laughs> living the dream other than chauffeuring nice. your kids around living yeah, the dream. Other than the all right <laughs> that is going to do it for this episode of the betting life podcast brought to you by fantasy life please subscribe to the show tell your degenerate betting friends join the discord see all of our bets in the free fantasy life bet tracker and follow us on social media at the fantasy grind and matt f the oracle thank you and see you again next episode